Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Wal. Today we're talking about the issue presented by lockdown. So many people have had to change their life, move things around, move out of London in fact, to find a new century for them. And my guest today, Katie Glass, is no exception. She's a columnist and future writer. Her new column for The Telegraph, Stella's magazine, covers her journey from pre-wedding bliss in London to moving alone to Land's End to restart her life during lockdown. And as, a, as an established future writer, Katie specializes in long form futures and interviews often exploring issues affecting young people. She has also investigated children who commit violent crimes and online sexual exploitation. An award-winning travel journalist, her journey on the Travel Mongolia Railway has been a viral Twitter sensation. Her work is regularly appears in publications such as The Telegraph, The Sunday Times, The Evening Standards, The Sun, and many, many more. Kate, Kate regularly makes broadcast appearances. In 2020, she wrote and presented a Radio 4 documentary about, about discovering your Judaism, and appeared in two documentaries discussing child murder cases. I'm super excited to talk to her about her own journey, about being a journalist, and most importantly, challenges lockdown has presented in her life. Now, meet Katie. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. I have the amazing Katie here. She's a future, future writer, she's a journalist. And I'm so glad, as I said in my introduction, to have her to talk about her lockdown journey. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. As well as anyone can be right now. Well, you look well. You look amazingly good. So I'm so glad, you know, it's so it's good to see you. Um, your work is so fantastic. But before we go into all of that, can you just tell us about who you are? Yeah, you asked me this question, who is Katie Glass? And I think I saw it and had a mini existential crisis because the truth is I'm about to turn 40. We're in a pandemic, as we'll probably get to. And I sort of write about, I broke up with my fiance, sold my house, lost my job all during the pandemic. So actually I'm not quite sure who Katie Glass is at the moment. Probably I'm actually in a bit of a crisis as I work out, but um, who I am mostly is I'm a journalist and I write news features, uh, sort of investigative pieces. I do some celebrity interviews. And as a new thing for me, I've started doing this column for the Telegraph where I write about this experience I'm having during lockdown, which isn't just a sort of existential crisis on the page. It's also practical things about how I'm trying to find a house and rebuild a sort of new life for myself. That's wonderful. I, I hope you find this story because I just turned 40 last year and I could tell you, so oh, oh, it was all, all a whole different kind of scene and scenarios. I was thinking, what does it mean to be turn, turning 40? And everyone has this old vision of 40. And I just, you know what, I got to one day and said, you know what, it's just another day. You just don't make a big deal out of it. Don't oversize it, just go with it. And it was, it was good. Uh, it, you have been writing, one of your future, um, what you focus on is about kids. You talk about you know, children who've committed violent crimes, online, online sexual exploitation. Why did you focus on that subject? Because I think it's really niche area to focus on. Uh, yeah, it's quite a long <laughs> story, but I'll, I'll start you on it and see uh, how bored you get. So, well, originally I just loved writing. When I was little, I would you know, be one of those kids who was always making up silly poems or writing little stories. So I loved writing and I went to university to do English thinking I would try and make loads of money as a barrister or something like that. I, I didn't really have a you know, plan. Um, so while I was at university to pay my way through university, I got a job as an estate agent. Um, so I'm sitting in my estate agent's office, you know, not doing much because I wasn't very good actually, um, reading this magazine that he used to have, a free magazine about how to be an estate agent or, you know, the, all the properties. And in this sort of arrogant moment of youth, the kind of thing you do when you're like, you know, 18 and cocky or whatever, 
I met the editor of that magazine and just sort of said, this is terrible writing and I could write you something great about being an estate agent. Anyway, he thought it was sort of charming and gave me, let me write this piece about being an estate agent. And from there, I started writing a column about my life as a student. And then I got a job with them and I started doing those sort of glossy dream home features where I would go to the houses and describe them. Um, so the long answer to your question is that I guess I became a journalist before I really understood what journalism was or what I could do with it. So over time, as I sort of became a journalist, I understood, I guess, if I had a sort of um, gift, it was that I could tell stories. Uh, and I guess I'd always been doing that. But, you know, I started to sort of think, what do I want to tell? Which wasn't necessarily these stories about these boring houses I was viewing every day. Mm -hmm. um, so my background uh, is that I had had quite a difficult sort of childhood. My mum had been very unwell and I'd had to move out when I was 17. And I guess when when you're in those sort of positions, the truth is you, you, you're you very powerless. I felt very powerless. You know, no one hears those stories. Like, it, you know, you've got nowhere. I used to sit looking at papers before I became a journalist thinking, how do you ever get in a paper? You know, like, how do you even get in a newsroom? It was such an alien world. I'd never met a journalist before I sort of became one. Um, so these two things were happening at the same time. One was that I was becoming a, you know, more confident journalist, more well-known, I was getting more commissions, and I was starting to understand the stories I really wanted to tell, the stories by people who couldn't tell them, and often that's children, mm. um, and that I had a sort of empathy I could bring to those situations, because I had been in them, mm. um, and so I wasn't sort of bowling into interviews going, oh yeah, great, you know, I know what it's like to have left home, but like I did do pieces about like youth homelessness, and I think you know, people can tell, can't they? You know, and I felt like I was bringing something that maybe some of the middle-aged men in suits who went to do these interviews, they weren't bringing so directly because I was bringing my own experience. So I guess those are some of the pieces I feel really, really proud of. And because um, I'm telling stories I really care about and I'm trying to tell stories on behalf of people who wouldn't necessarily end up in the paper or wouldn't necessarily have a platform to tell those stories themselves. Um, and then through that I've just become really interested in you know like I did a thing about uh, young people committing crimes and learn about you know I, I think the very privileged thing about journalism as you probably know is you get to learn all the time yes. so I hadn't even realized that um, the age of criminal responsibility is so young in this country you know before children can even like lose their virginity or like buy a house or whatever they can be you know be um, done for crimes they've committed and I thought that was sort of shocking so again to be in this position where I was able to like meet young people tell those stories and because of the platform I had at a sort of national paper question whether it was acceptable for us to be prosecuting young children you know that was sort of a culmination of lots of things I really cared about oh, that's, that's a long cool. story <laughs> that is amazing because I love the way you said it's all about empathy because they're setting stories one needs to cover but if you can't cover that story in the right way it's very difficult to get the the person to be comfortable to tell their story and I've seen it so many times when you want to get something out of someone that they have to be in that, and you need to have that probably background. You had you 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 know about being compassionate to people to understand that I'm telling you a story, but I'm not telling that story to mock you or to laugh at you. But I'm telling this story to see how I can help you and move you to the next direction. And I think this is something. You, this is why your work is featured on. You've won a numerous award for it because of your the way your language is. And I've read it. I've read a lot of your stories, and it's just just so beautifully told. Please keep doing that amazing work. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm getting old now, <laughs> but I did used to feel, I guess, because I was one of the younger feature writers, mm -hmm. that I could approach young people, yeah, with a different attitude. Like, so for example, I did a piece about um, young men and sending, they send, uh, they get, um, it, it was about sextortion, it's called. So they mm -hmm. meet someone online who asks them for some sort of sexy pictures. And when they send them, they get extorted for huge amount of money. Um, it's a really terrible thing that happens, you know, and actually young men have committed suicide over it. Mm -hmm. And I guess I knew that I'd read things about that, which had felt quite judgy to me. And I felt like I could go in quite honestly as a young person and say, look, we've all done stuff like that. Yeah. And that meant like I wasn't sort of empathizing in a sort of abstract way. I could sort of come and say, you know, I've, I've had those experiences too. And so I felt that there was a like trust between me and some of the interviewing. Yeah because of that that's beautiful when your work first featured in the in papers like the you know the Daily Telegraph the Sunday Times the Evening Standards all of this place 
How did you take it? How did you feel? Because you, your journey was never to become a journalist, he told on you. So when you, when you first saw your work, how did you take that on? Uh, I, how did I? Well, when I was starting sort of later, you know, there's a bit in journalism, I don't know if everyone knows about, where you actually are just sort of doing stuff for other people and your name's not even in the paper. So I think I was like, at first, I just sort of thought, oh, this isn't going to go anywhere. You know, no one even knows this is me sort of slaving away behind the scenes. But um, yeah, I mean, it's still exciting. I've been a journalist for, I don't want to say how long, since I left university. <laughs> it's like 12, 13, 14 years. Um, and I still get really excited if I see my name in the paper or a piece. And still scared too, you know, because you're like, yeah. so many, you, when you're sitting there writing it on your own in your bedroom, you don't really think about anyone reading it. And then suddenly... <laughs> All these people are reading it, so it's a, a mixed experience. It that it gives you that cringy feeling that oh my goodness, I just did this in my little place, and all of a sudden it's it's going viral because I've heard some of your work has gone viral as well. So that's really fascinating. Um, so journalism today has totally changed. I think with the whole culture of the world, just the language is used, you have to be careful about things. What are some of the pressures of modern journalism, would you say that are out there? Well, there's like loads of pressures, aren't there? Uh, I think the big one is that, is journalism gonna last? You know, some of those pieces that I've been able to do, some of them have taken real trust with editors where I've said, I'm really interested in this subject. Please let me go up to this town where this thing has happened and I will meet people and I will find out what happened and, you know, talk to locals. And they've got to invest money in sending you off on some story on the off chance you might get something, you know, um, and give you, sometimes it takes weeks. I mean, some of the stories with young people, I wrote about um, young people and transitioning and um, well, not transitioning, but young people who are questioning their gender identity. I mean, those stories took months to get to know families and see if they wanted to work with you. And so I think the sort of investment in journalism and giving the, the chance for people to write those big pieces, um, that is probably disappearing, which is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic, I found it extremely hard. Normally, I guess the way I operate is I meet people probably like you and you know, you create a rapport and they get to know you. And like, I feel like they can meet me and they can see they can trust me. And maybe we talk about stuff that's not just journalism at first and see if they're comfortable. Of course, all of that's gone now. It's like, you know, you're on Zoom, you sort of do the interview. It's very hard to connect with people randomly. You know, these random, I used to meet people in a bar and they'd tell me some amazing thing they'd heard. And I think, oh, that's fascinating. That's a, a story, you know, and that, that just doesn't happen now, does it? So, yeah. But that feels sad. Yeah, I feel sad that I'm not connecting. I think it gave me a lot of energy, maybe like for you too. It, it was a really important thing for me actually to connect with people in that way. That is the bit I miss the most actually, is that connection. Because I think true connection, when you meet people, you have a different story and you get more, they get to understand you and they feel we're not just having a general conversation. So I, I, I feel that as well. And it's really, really, um, it's really difficult because I just feel with the Zoom, conversation I feel we're just we're so two separate people and just having a conversation that's it but with human human interaction I feel we could continue that conversation and take it even further and it's something I tend to enjoy a lot is that taking it further and then the there's their trust elements as well which is nice I love that about it yeah I think with really sensitive subjects especially yeah. Yeah. sometimes moments you just want to sit together or yeah. I've yeah. been as a journalist where I felt like, or I have hugged people, even though I've been on the fence about whether it was professional, you know, like, it's just like a real interaction. And I think it's really hard to go into a space and yeah. say, right, tell me the most personal thing that ever happened to you when you're doing it via a, a computer Absolutely. screen. Absolutely. This lockdown has caused um, a lot of changes for your life. I mean, I think one of the key things you really now, you said it yourself that you're focusing on what you're talking about is this lockdown. On an Instagram post, you talked about why you left London to change your life during lockdown. Were you always a Londoner and why did you leave London? I wasn't always a Londoner. In fact, I sort of ended up in London under duress. Um, I think I thought of myself as a sort of country person. When I was very little, we lived in rural Wales, in North Wales, in the middle of, middle of nowhere. Um, then I lived in Somerset when I was a teenager and then went to university in Brighton. So I had sort of gravitated towards smaller places. But when I realized I wanted to be a journalist, well, then that was it, you had to go to London. So um, I went to London. I mean, I absolutely 
I still haven't like fallen out of love with London. I mean, it's an amazing, exciting place. I love the arts, like every single day, right? You're doing something different. And if, if like us, you sort of thrive on meeting new people and hearing interesting stories, I mean, London is that every day, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but then during lockdown, a million things happened. Um, one of which is that I broke up with my fiance uh, right at the beginning of lockdown. So that was March last year or like, no, so May last year we separated. Um, I had a, a job with a paper, which I lost at the time. And we had been selling my flat in London, me and my fiance, so we could buy something together. And in this sort of mad moment, this is my midlife crisis that was obviously looming. Um, the estate agent called me and said, we've got a buyer for your flat. And I sort of said, oh, my whole life's fallen apart. I've broken up with my fiance. <laughs> I don't think I want to sell it, you know, forget it. And then went home and sort of cried for a week. And then at some point in that week thought, do you know what? I think I'm gonna, Just I'm gonna sell the flat and run away. And I, I, so I wasn't a Londoner. I'd already had always had this idea about going back to the country. And um, what I really craved, I suppose, was was peace and headspace to think. And just it brings me a real sense of calm, just being around the mm -hmm. sea and the fields and mountains. And so, um, yeah, in lockdown, that was quite a profound change to my life because I, I was an adopted Londoner right so I mean it's been quite an adjustment to sort of leave I was living in I lived in Soho for a bit and then I lived in Dalston so I'd always lived in these really central busy places too oh, and now yes. I'm in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with no you can't hear I can hear the odd sheep <laughs> very busy but you know how did but you know with relationships and everything how did your relationship break down during lockdown because I think I've been hearing a lot of that now a lot of people are saying they're going they're going through breakup they're divorcing even people who've been married for many many years are saying look we've been locked in this place where did you think that communication changed between you and your fiance um so i will say that was one of the first pieces where we i had been through this awful experience of breaking up with him and i sort of clocked that because it was early in the lockdown yeah it was may so it'd been a couple of months I sort of realised a lot of other people were facing this or going through this too. And so I think that was one of the first pieces where instead of writing about other people, I thought I'm going to really write honestly about my experience here. Mm. Um, and it just seemed to really speak to people because I think a lot of people are dealing with it. I mean, it is, we're in touch now, actually, almost a year later, me and the fiance. And I think we're both um, fairly calm about it because we understand it was just, it's just been a really unprecedented situation unprecedented situation for us um we normally in the normal scheme of things he was out constantly at work he had a startup so he would be off doing that I would be around town doing interviews I did a lot of travel journalism so I'd be away every other week I mean there was a point last year where he went crazy because I think I was away every weekend so I was constantly traveling and when you're traveling you know you can have a row but then the next day you're on a plane and then the sort of agony of missing each other sets in so we had all this breathing room all the time I think and then suddenly in lockdown we were stuck together 24 hours a day under huge amount of stress um his family were unwell my family were unwell obviously we're both struggling with work everyone's stressed right mm -hmm. um and it turned out that as a couple we were extremely bad at dealing with stress together. <laughs> um, I became really anxious and needed him. And he became really angry and didn't want to be like near anyone. Yeah. So we wanted completely opposite, you know, things um, and found ourselves in just this impossible. And then of course, the claustrophobia of being stuck together, that sort of release valve we'd been used to where I would disappear and, oh, you know, it's fine now. Or he would go out for a night with his mates. All of that had gone. Um, when we met you know we sort of met classic romance one night stand out <laughs> but that's the kind of people we were right like we like to go out and have a good time and in our relationship we were always at festivals or having nights out together we'd say oh I don't know like I, I love that about him that we'd be sitting on the sofa and go oh, let's dress up and just go clubbing or what you know so we had like a real energy to our relationship and of course that disappeared we didn't have any fun together suddenly you know we we would have an awful day of me being anxious him being angry being stuck together and we couldn't even sort of have the release of saying oh come on let's go for a nice meal or let's um just one of the you know that sort of joyful stuff and I think um I had a bit of a I guess maybe I had to grow up quite quickly because I suddenly looked at him and thought you know it's not just a relationship is it with a marriage 
Mm. We're going to face a lot of this and we're going to have children together. We were trying to have children and mm. children are stress and difficult decisions. And it was just really realizing that um, the two of us are not very good at dealing with this stuff together. And if we, you know, what if we have a, a child and the child's unwell or we've got issues over school or just thought me and me and this man, we 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 cannot do this together. So it was really hard, but um, it was really hard to leave. But they, I think the other thing that happened, uh, and I think it's happened to a lot of people with uh, the pandemic and coronavirus, is it gives you a bit of a sense of your own mortality, right? Like, not that we thought we were going to die, but like it made you really think life is short. Yeah. And I was really unhappy, and you know, not I hadn't been unhappy the whole time with him, but certainly as time went on. I didn't want to get out of bed some days and just felt just like I just couldn't find anything to make me sort of happy and mm. I just thought you know I can't live like this and he's not happy I'm not happy and actually weirdly when we both decided you know to separate it wasn't easy especially because you've built this whole life with someone in your head you know we were going to get married we were trying to have a baby but um I think I do feel a bit happier now because don't know just trying to make my own happiness out there which is what you're all about right <laughs> I think I think what you're saying is right because I think this lockdown gave us time to ourselves which we've never had before before we could we could go out we could go to the you know go even go to the shop go look around and look at look at things and that takes your mind away from your own problem because one of the ways human beings tend to deal with life I found is by distracting you get something to distract you and you forget about the problem. Then by the time you come back to the problem, you're hoping that the, it's not as bad as if you initially left it. But with the pandemic during lockdown, I think a lot of people couldn't do any of that. They were all stuck. Mm. And the problem was constantly in their face. And I think it gave people that uh, realization that if you're going to stay in something, it has to be absolutely worth it. Life is absolutely short and you have to be happy because we never know when this life will end. And I think this is something, this is your journey you found along this way of this lockdown. But in doing this, you found joy along this way. Can you tell us about your new life now? Who is, what is Katie doing? <laughs> Who knows? I, I mean, I, I am trying to find joy and some days I find joy, but joy is not, um, Unfortunately, it's not something you can sort of put in a pot and go, yes, I've got it, you know. As you know, it's like a constant, constant mission. Um, <laughs> well, um, what am I doing? So, so yeah, so in this mo moment when the estate agent called and said, do you want to sell the flat? And I thought, no, and then I thought, yes, go on, I'm going to do it. So what proceeded was just the most exhausting mad story. When I was with the fiance, we had a little VW van, little camper van we used to go around in. Anyway, when I left him, I disappeared in the van, took the van, um, and then when I decided to sell the flat, uh, when it was possible to do viewings, just sort of set off. I didn't have another car, so I only had this silly little camper van. And so disappeared off around the country in my little VW, trying to find somewhere that um, I could make a new home and ended up in Cornwall. Um, I think because there was nowhere left to drive. So drove and drove and drove and drove till I got to literally Land's End and saw this beautiful house and uh, yeah thought that's it I think I, I want to be here and was just just had a sort of sense of peace so that's what I've I guess I've been doing so since the um, end of the first lockdown I've been down in Cornwall and that has been a huge adjustment so I've gone on living in this road in Dalston where I mean I was right on the main strip so it was just like sirens constantly and noise all night like just 24 hours a day madness you know and you'd leave and the whole world would be there it was like I was in my sort of normal life, I would be going to meetings in Soho all the time and like going out with my friends, you know. And now I guess I'm just sort of lolling around the country, smiling at sheep, trying to pat them. No idea what I'm doing obviously because I'm actually a sort of city person now. Um, yeah. trying <laughs> and trying to build this life. So found this house, it didn't work out, but I, I did decide to move to Cornwall. So I've been looking at sort of properties, um, Finding a house is a funny thing. I think it probably is a bit like finding a life because every time you see one, you're imagining yourself in this new sort of setup, aren't you? You know, sort of like, do I want to be in this little cottage in a village around people or do I want to be up on a mountain on my own? Or So I feel like maybe the joy I'm having now is quite a complicated joy because it's not straightforward. It's not like a bag of sweets, mm. happiness. Um, it's like every day trying to work out who I am and 
make a shift and decide what I want out of life. But I also feel loads of freedom. I mean, it's quite a funny, you know, I never, you have this picture of what it might be like at 40, you know, oh. which is gonna be my next birthday. Well, I have managed, it, it never looked like this. Like this year, I thought I would have a baby. I was supposed to be getting married this year. And now I haven't even got a mortgage, you know, so I've got rid of the mortgage, haven't got any bills. You know, I'm sort of madly footloose and fancy free. And sometimes that feels really exciting. And sometimes that feels petrifying, but yeah. I'll tell you what it does feel. It feels alive. Yeah. Um, it didn't always feel that when I was in that sort of relationship thinking what well, looking down the barrel of a marriage I wasn't very happy in exactly. so, and you may joy isn't it feeling alive it's not that always is great. Not joy you're buying the message of hope um, to anyone who's looking going through something similar right now and at least you kind of know your where you where you stand what would be your message to anyone going through something similar with this lockdown challenges because I we you know even though our prime minister has given us the schedule of when this lockdown will ease there will be pain that will come out of lockdown, whether we like it or not, it's all sorts of kind of pain. What will be your message to other people going through similar pain? Oh, um, I think you have to embrace change and see it as opportunity. That's all you can do. You know, it was, it was really, I don't want to sort of sugarcoat it. It was really hard not being with my partner and uh, not having the job I had, which I felt like sort of defined me in some ways. It's been really hard, but then I've sort of tried to flip it on its head and think, I can do anything. I can do anything, you know, and if we've got one thing actually in lockdown, which I think is exciting, is we have time to dream. You know, sometimes I just find myself daydreaming, thinking, oh, maybe I won't stay in Cornwall, maybe I'll buy something in Greece, or maybe <laughs> I'll start a new life in Spain, or I don't know, and, and maybe I won't do any of those things. But like the dreaming, like you said, it sort of gives me hope, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that's the positive thing of lockdown. I think you just have to, you, you just have to try and find the positive side of it because, because what else can you do, right? Like it's bad anyway. It's only worse if you're stressed about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Katie Glass, I'm absolutely delighted to have you join me in this conversation. You really shared an inspiration, true story of lockdown pains. And I'm really happy how you detailed it. For anyone who's listening, will understand that there is pain, but that is it. at the same time, there is lots of joy as well. Thank you so much for this Thank conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely to yeah. see you.